being a single parent, even though you're married, is it can be anything from you know, running the kids here or there. It can be the concerts at school. That can be the softball games, you know, without dad. It can be the family functions without dad. Um, your family may or may not understand. You know, I know a lot of families have a lot of generational firefighters in that, so they understand the way that works. But kind of in the regular world, people don't necessarily understand it. They say they do. But, um, you know, they'll always ask, oh, where's Mark? And I'll say he's working. And sometimes you get, oh, you know, that's great. We understand. Sometimes they're like, can't he come? No, he can't. You know, there's a lot of people that are still out there working when everybody isn't that I don't know what our lives would be like if they weren't. Fire, police, just all different kinds of people. And, you know, it, it's really hard on holidays, I think, especially if you have kids. Um, when the kids are little, they don't understand why dad can't be there for their birthday or for Christmas or, you know, any special event if he's working. And um, I think, you know, you, you do the best you can. Sometimes we would go up to the fire station on those birthdays or holidays so that he could still see them because it's not just the kid's side, but it's his side as well. He misses out. We really do have two families. We have, you know, our immediate family, our blood relatives, if you will. But then we also have the fire department family. And, you know, my kids have grown up with these people and, you know, look at them as as if they are their family, you know, their blood relatives. And, you know, they're some of their favorite people and they're some of the, you know, special people to them in their lives. I mean, even from when the kids were little, just going up and visiting, you know, their dad to doing social things as families, you know, outside of the fire department, that feeling, if you, even if you ask them to this day and they're almost 18 and 20, it's their fire family. That's how they know these people. When I would go to work in the mornings and my husband was coming off shift and he had to take the kids to either school or daycare when they were little, um, I would pull into the station and a couple of the guys would come out and take the kids out of their car seats and, you know, kind of chase them around and play with them for a few minutes. And then, you know, dad would go his way and I would go on to work. And they still remember those as some of their best memories, going to the parades and, you know, their dad dressed as the fire dog one parade. Just, you know, different things in life that they definitely remember those people. These are the people he works with day in and day out. You know, I don't work with people for 24 hours a day. I don't know what that's like. And you may like everybody, you may not like everybody, you may have your differences, but you have to trust them to bring you home and trust Mark to bring, you know, bring them home and vice versa. So, no, not jealousy. It's it's a deep a deep family, you know, love in a lot of different ways. A couple of Christmases ago, there was started off as any Christmas would that he was working or any day that he's working, you know. You don't really think twice about it anymore. He just goes off to work. I've never been a very big worrier about him at work. I know that seems kind of strange to a lot of people, but I never really have. I've been with him from the beginning, and he's either sheltered me from things that I find out later or, you know, I worry about the things that I need to worry about when, when it's time, if that, if that makes sense. Um, but when you talk to other people, they're like, oh, aren't you worried all the time? And I'm really not. So he was working Christmas Day, and um, a bunch of the wives on the fire department have a Facebook group chat type thing. And I was getting all kinds of messages, and there was a lot of, as I keep calling it, chatter amongst the wives. Um, and I think that this is kind of typical. There's some wives that are very gung-ho into the fire department and, you know, love everything about it and, and want to know all the details of everything going on and, you know, the gossip and the work and the, you know, everything involved. And then you have others that love the fire department but maybe aren't as, you know, into every little action. And I guess that's kind of more me. I've always been that way. I love what my husband does. I respect what my husband does but I don't have to know, you know, everything about it. And that's not good or bad. That's just how it is. Um, so there was a lot of chatter that morning, and I kind of saw these messages, you know, has anybody heard from so-and-so, or has anybody heard about this or heard about that? And I kind of started to think, hmm, what's going on? And it's not uncommon for me and my husband to, 
you know, maybe text once a day or twice a day. We don't text all day long and, you know, call all day long. Just maybe a message here or there, you know, this is what happened today or, you know, things like that. Nothing of a lot. And um, so the chatter kept going a little bit more and they were talking about different stations that were involved in this fire and, you know, the the anxiety starts to ramp up a little bit just because you don't know exactly what's happening. Um, you don't really want to turn on the news to see, um, but I probably did. And um, we were supposed to go to my sister's house for Christmas Day, Mark being at work. Uh, you know, my daughters and I were going to go over there. And so I just sent my sister a quick text. I don't know what's happening today yet. Just I know it's Christmas Day, but I don't know what's happening yet. And the chatter kept going on, and I hadn't heard anything. And um, I saw a little bit on the news, and I got a text from him. And the text just said, I'm okay. I love you. Everybody got out. I'll talk to you later. I love you. That's all I needed. I knew he was okay. I knew, for the most part, everybody else was okay. Um, and I knew I would hear more later, when he could. But even though that helped, it still, the anxiety was still there, obviously. But um, just knowing that part, because then the calls started coming to me, and the text started coming directly to me. Have you heard? Is Mark okay? We heard somebody was trapped. We heard this. We heard that. And then my anxiety, even though I knew he was okay, finding out little bits of things, you know, along the way, started to ramp it up. But I knew he was okay. Um, so my daughters and I kind of just waited all day to see what was happening, what progressed, and our plan was just to kind of go to the station. Just We wanted to check on him. We just wanted to say hi. You know, we just wanted to hug him. And um, I got a text saying he was he was back. It's Christmas Day. There's no food. They didn't cook. They didn't do anything. Nothing's open. So we just stopped, I think, at McDonald's and grabbed some food and for them when we got there. And um, it, we didn't really talk about it. I just remember hugging him and crying, um, especially because on the drive there, um, I remember I was driving and I don't know which daughter was in the front seat with me, but one of them was, and they got a text from their dad. I don't know if it went to our little group text or if it went to them directly and not to me on purpose, um, but it was a picture of him on the front page of what was going to be the paper, of him holding onto the ladder with one arm dangling there with, you know, the flames in the windows. Um, I, I don't know if I just slowed down or I pulled over at that point, but they didn't want to show me, but I could hear them, you know, kind of, <gasps> and I'm like, oh, no, what now? Thinking maybe they went back out or something else happened, and uh, it was the picture. And I was still obviously worried and anxiety and upset, but also um, really mad, <laughs> really mad. Um, wanted to kick his butt. That's what I probably told him when I saw him. And um, I knew then that I needed to just listen, whether it was that night, the next day, two days later, however long it took. I needed to be that rock that he could go to because, yeah, he's been in lots of fires and lots of different things, but I knew this one obviously was so much bigger for a lot of reasons. And um, we went to see him at the station and all of that. And, you know, I think set everybody a little bit at ease. And then he came home the next day like he normally would, a little withdrawn. And then I didn't want to prompt him. I didn't, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? I knew, obviously, this had affected him a great deal. So I just wanted to be available, whether it was, you know, when he wanted to talk or if he got emotional or whatever it was. I just knew that that's what my role needed to be in this was when he's ready to talk about it, 
be ready. And um, like I said, that day he came home, I don't, he was, you know, kind of distant. It really wasn't there yet. But the calls kept coming in. The texts kept coming in. And with each one of those, I could see everything kind of coming back and building up inside of him. And I don't think it was really until the, like, we talked a little bit about it, I'm sure. But I know when he went back to work the next day and found out more information, that's, I think, kind of when the floodgates kind of started to release for him as to all those feelings coming out and, um, you know, about the May Day that he didn't call and all of the different feelings and emotions of other people, you know, coming to him and telling him what they thought and what they saw. And, I mean, I know when I saw that picture, I joke like I wanted to kick his butt, but I, I know he saved people, but it was also hard because he's supposed to come home. 